All right. Well, thank you everyone for being here for um, the Linda Loring Nature Foundation Science Pub. Um, we're going to get started in just a few minutes. I'm just going to um, give some introductions and some program notes to everybody. Uh, first of all, I am Dr. Sarah Boyce. I'm the Director of Research and Education at the Linda Loring Nature Foundation. Um, and at the Linda Loring Nature Foundation, for those of you who don't know, I mean, now that we're our science pub is on Zoom, we have people from um, all over, both our speakers and our audience members. So that's really wonderful. Um, but to introduce you a bit to the Linda Loring Nature Foundation, we are a small land trust located on Nantucket Island. And uh, we're about connecting people with science and nature very broadly. And Science Pub is one of the programs that we do to, um, to do that. Uh, I encourage you all to visit llnf.org if you wanna learn more about all our different programs uh, what we do in uh, research, education, conservation, and stewardship. Um, and for those who are on Nantucket or planning to come to Nantucket at some point, I would invite everyone out to our property at 110 Eel Point Road. Uh, we have 275 acres of open space. Our trails are free and open to the public year round. Um, so I, enjoy, I encourage everyone to come out. And if you're not on Nantucket, get out into your local nature center, nature habitat and enjoy um, the wilds. Although we're gonna be hearing about our own yeah, local yard habitats today. So, um, so that might be a little bit different. Um, so just some other program notes. I am excited to announce our first ever Linda Loring Nature Foundation trivia night, um, Thursday, February 18th. Some of the questions might come from this very science pub presentation. Um, it's gonna be at six o'clock. Um, go to llnf.org for more information about how to sign up your team. It's free. It's just going to be fun and silly and um, competitive. I'm sure it's going to be really competitive. Um, <laughs> and before I introduce tonight's speakers, I just wanted to make a quick mention that our next Science Pub is going to be a month from tonight on uh, Monday, March 8th at 5 p.m. Um, Austin Gallinger from Beneath the Waves organization is going to be speaking about um, ocean health and um, ocean conservation with a focus on, they have an affinity for sharks, but really a focus on um, threatened species, conservation and marine protected areas. So if you wanna hear, if you wanna learn more about that and register for that talk, you can also go to llnf.org, our events page where all of our Science Pub speakers are listed for the season. All right, so Science Pub, um, as the name implies, we used to have this back in the olden days um, at, a, at a bar or a pub and have an informal science talk where we could have a beer and chat over some really cool research and conservation. We're still going to have a chat over some cool research and conservation efforts, um, but we are now on Zoom like everything else is. Um, this is our seventh season, I'm realizing, um, for Science Pubs. So we've had a lot of opportunities to talk about research and conservation. Um, I want to acknowledge our local partners, though. Um, our Saltbox Tavern and Table was our restaurant that has housed us for the last two years. And so I just bring that up to encourage everyone to support your local um, restaurants and um, hopefully we'll be back in person again sometime in the future. Um, general logistics. Uh, for those of you who are, are um, have questions during the talk, feel free to ch um, type in the chat or in the Q&A as we go along. Um, I'm going to wait till the end of the talk and then I will field questions to our speakers but just type them in as they come along and as you think of the questions um, uh, so that we can, um, and then we'll answer them all at the end. Um, and I, and you know, also any logistics or anything that comes up, feel free to type in the chat. I'll be monitoring that during the talk. So with that, I'm very excited for tonight's Science Pub Talk. Um, we have Dr. Chris Neal, the senior scientist at the Woodwell Climate Research Center in Falmouth. And Dr. Desiree Narango, a Smith Conservation Fellow at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And we're gonna be talking about um, the Yard Futures Project tonight, the science behind yard management to increase plant, insect, and bird biodiversity. Um, and there is one question already. Yes, we are recording. Uh, the recording um, will be posted on the Linda Loring Nature Foundation website later this week. So thank you for that, that quick note. I forgot to mention that. So with that, uh, thank you to Chris and Desiree, and I will hand it over to you. Okay, thanks, thanks, Sarah. I'm just going to share my my screen. So we're Desiree and I are doing tonight a tag team. I'm going to start off uh, in some ways chronologically uh, with 
some background on how she and I both got into this question of trying to do science around uh, the ecology of backyard ecosystems. Uh, and I'm going to cover sort of phase one of this project in which we address this sort of more theoretical question about what are people doing by making residential areas across North America? What is it? How is it changing things? And, uh, and then I'll hand it to Desiree and she's going to be able to answer the question you're probably most interested in. And that is like, what does the science tell you about what you can actually do in your backyards? to uh, potentially increase plant, insect, and bird uh, biodiversity. Well, about 10 years ago now, I got into a discussion with some scientific colleagues of mine around the country. And, and I, you know, I've lived in Falmouth for more than 30 years. I work on coastal ecosystems, questions of how changing land use influences uh, sort of watershed nutrient runoff to the coast. I work with Sarah a little bit on grasslands and how we could better manage coastal grasslands. So I'm very interested in questions about how humans are influencing land use generally. And if we look across North America these days, and we sort of look at this bottom left image of where the lights are, you know, where the lights are on at night across North America, it becomes very clear that humans are influencing and altering very, very large areas uh, of, of the continent simply by their living there. And we've become a nation of sprawl. We, we, we most of us, you know, so, sort of live in, and now we're a suburban nation. More than half the people in the United States live in what would, we would typically classify as suburbia, not a city center. Those lights match up absolutely marvelously with the proportion of land that's in residential yards. And you want to think about that as grass that forms turf grass area. This was a paper that came out about 15 years ago and, and uh, was sort of the first continental map of lawns. But it's clear that by occupying lots and lots of North America with residential landscapes, we've created this, what, what I would term a novel ecosystem, and that is of backyards. And when we started thinking about this, we, we came to the conclusion, I, I, I actually had a meeting, it was actually on Skype, right? This, we, we were meeting to try to decide, well, how should we think about this scientifically? I put up an image of cities, you know, two cities, and I said, my goodness, you know, can you, can you tell from this image what city this is? And the answer is most people couldn't. The left-hand image is Boston, the right hand is, is Phoenix. But they look a lot the same, right? We have transformed the land that used to be there in a natural state and pushed it into this sort of the, the, this residential uh, this residential configuration that is like these kind of urban savannas of trees, grass, concrete, right? And we came up with this idea that we then spent several years trying to address, uh, and that is. Are we by res by creating residential landscapes, you know, homogenizing the ecosystems of, of North America? And by homogenizing, uh, I mean we're taking natural ecosystems like this woodland in the you know in and around Boston, a deciduous eastern deciduous woodland. You know, we're taking the forests of the Mid Atlantic and Baltimore. You know, the, the the scrub ecosystems of you know the borders of the Everglades in Miami, Sonoran Desert, desert scrub prairie in Minneapolis, and we're pushing it toward this, you know, the, 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 this, this, this different system that's very, very different from the system that it came from, but potentially very much like other systems like it in residential areas across the United States, despite the fact that the original systems were just incredibly different from each other. And so Peter Groffman, our colleague who, who has led us in this project for several years, and I, I'm, I'm the person in, responsible for Boston here, uh, you know, he made the claim this urban land use is homogenizing the US by producing residential ecosystems that are more similar to each other than to the natural systems they replace. And we called this project the ecological homogenization of urban America. And we set out to try to understand this, th these transformations in their various forms, all the different ways they, they occurred. And we had colleagues that sort of by, by, by chance and by design, 
uh, in six cities across the United States. And, and uh, you know, we had Boston, Baltimore, you know, Boston is kind of wet, the green areas get more rain, you know, the blue areas get the most, you know, so we have some cities that are in the east that are sort of cool and wet, middle temperature and wet, hot and wet, city in the middle that's sort of on the border between the, you know, the, the woodland and the prairie, and then two cities out in the west that are quite hot and dry. So we had this, 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 this gradient of climate across, across North America. And we submitted a grant to the National Science Foundation under this program that they had, was just emerging at that time called the Macrosystems Biology Program. And the Macrosystems Program really was intended to, to ask general, somewhat theoretical questions about how humans are altering systems at large scale. So here we were, we were gonna test this idea across all of North America. We had two ways to do that. One was surveying people. And this turned out to be very interesting. And I'm gonna to talk to you about some of these results uh, fr from the survey. We surveyed almost 10,000 people across the six cities. And we asked them all kinds of questions about what they do in their yard, what practices they use, sort of why they do what they do in their yards. And then we had a field component. And this component identified yards in each city that spanned gradients of, 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 of urban single family lots out to sort of exurban single family lots. We focused on this sort of residential single family land use across the country because it's what occupies large areas, right? You know, dense urban centers are a couple of percent of the area of all of North America where these landscapes, these sort of suburban landscapes occupy a much greater area and thus we thought had a, a were of, uh, a, a, of significance ecologically across a wider area. So we, 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 we designed a whole series of measurements that we would make across these gradients of density across these six cities with very different climates and original ecosystems from which they were originally created. And we measured a whole bunch of stuff and I'm gonna just hit a, a few highlights here. Uh, but we surveyed people about their management practices, whether they watered, whether they fertilized. Uh, we studied across these density gradients. Uh, we asked people about, you know, what they knew and what they cared about in terms of the things that their yards might be providing or the impacts their yards might be having. Uh, we actually measured microclimates, kind of this uh, urban heat island effect. We wanted to know whether the temperature and relative humidity of these suburban residential ecosystems were different from the systems from which they came. And one would imagine they would. You could imagine that in, in Phoenix, you were creating a city with lawns and, and, and backyards with people watering that might be quite a bit different in its microclimate than the Sonoran Desert that that city was, that that, that, that landscape was created from. And then we got into things that are sort of relevant for global change. We're interested in soil carbon. We're interested in soil uh, nitrogen cycling uh, patterns and rates because runoff is generated from these kinds of, of uh, landscapes and uh, we, we can learn a lot by studying soils. We looked at tree biomass and carbon and then what I'm going to end on here and hand off to, to Desiree is that we did a deep dive into biodiversity uh, to try to understand what drives, you know, what is the biodiversity of plants, birds, ground invertebrates, including and, and bees across these systems and then uh, sort of what's driving that and then what have we learned that might be relevant for uh, managing uh, that and, and potentially you know taking action in yards to, 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 to improve their abilities to, to support these these uh, the, this biodiversity. So I'm just going to show you a couple of these results and, and, and here I'm addressing this somewhat theoretical question of are we making a more homogeneous residential environment compared to those original ecosystems. So think about rainfall, precipitate, really total precipitation, including snow in, in centimeters per year across Baltimore, Boston, Los Angeles, Miami, Phoenix, uh, Phoenix, Minneapolis, there's a pretty big variation, right? You know, 20 inches of precip to 20 centimeters of precipitation in Phoenix versus, you know, 100 and 65 in, in, in Miami, for example. But when you look at 
the water environment created in backyards, it's much less variable, right? Where people are irrigating, especially in Los Angeles and Phoenix. But what I find remarkable about this is people irrigate everywhere, right? It doesn't matter whether you live in Boston or Miami or Phoenix or LA, you know, 60 some odd percent of people are watering in their backyards, right? So, so you're alleviating this drought stress in this residential environment broadly across North America. Nitrogen supply, this was interesting. There's a huge variation in nitrogen supply you know, in yards, in, in these are lawn soils, right? And again, by fertilizing, more than half of lawn owners world, you know, continent wide, according to our survey, uh, fertilize. So you're going from this very variable environment in terms of nitrogen richness to a much, much more homogeneous uh, environment. We also found, and I'm going to show you all the gory results because we've published a whole bunch of papers on each ones of, uh, 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 that cover a bunch of these topics. Uh, but we found that soils in yards were much more similar to each other than in the native ecosystems in terms of their carbon, their nitrogen, their, their, their characteristics, uh, their likelihood of leaching nitrogen into the groundwater that was all elevated in, in the sort of residential landscapes compared with, uh, with the native ecosystems. Temperature and humidity were much more similar to each other than in native ecosystem. Not really that surprising, right? Uh, and then we ask people, you know, do you like your yard? And the social scientists just, they really complained about this question because it wasn't, you know, they didn't think it was scientific. And, uh, but we had some on our team and, and we eventually uh, sort of asked some more sophisticated questions about that. But we thought, you know, it really matters. Like if people like what they have, they'd probably be less willing to change. So we're interested in A, whether they like their residential environment and what, you know, what are they aiming for? And, and, and I think both of those were important. So this is simply all the six cities, the responses to the questions to show that it's absolutely striking how similar the responses were across all the cities. And there's some quirks of surveying here, right? Nobody ever answers nine out of 10 to a survey. They answer either eight or 10. So some of these patterns is just were sort of universal, but are just sort of the people who do surveys know all about these things. But we found that, you know, people are very satisfied. Here's 10 is, I am very satisfied with my residential landscape. You know, here's very few people are, are, are not satisfied at all. So then we asked, well, what do you have, you know, wh why are you doing what you're doing? And, and, and we term these things as ecosystem services, right? This is this concept that, 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 that land, whether managed land or natural land is providing uh, a service uh, or, or uh, you know, s s s s s some, s s s yeah, s some benefits to, 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 to you. You might not be paying for them, but it, it's a service nonetheless. And we asked us sort of, what do you like about your yard and why, what are you aiming for? And yet the people answered high, three out of three means three was the highest, zero was the lowest in this. Creates a beautiful yard, provides personal enjoyment, easy to maintain, looks nice, easy to take care of. That's the bottom line, that's what people want. But we're also interested in things that I care deeply about like, like, uh, you know, how are they benefiting the environment? Are they helping us adapt to climate change? And well, it turns out that while people think supporting wildlife is important, yeah, native plants to the area, some people care, but it, it, it falls down a bit. And then these other features, reduces pollution to local water, helps with climate change. People are just not thinking about those things in their yards at all, according to our survey. Uh, so this is an opportunity for maybe some education, but also some, some uh, you know, it, it's a challenge because if people are not thinking about these things when managing their yards, then uh, they may be using fertilizer or not doing things that help uh, with these broader uh, environmental issues. We also had fun. Social scientists were there, they were a challenge for the natural scientists to get onto the same page about some things, but, it, but we really had a lot of fun and we, we did things like we tested this idea that one of them termed the landscape mullet hypothesis. That was that 
that there, you know, when it comes to managing your yard, there's kind of business and presentability in the front, but there's a party in the back. And the idea was that we, by looking at what, what, how people managed and what was actually there in the front yard versus the backyard, that people, that we thought there'd be a strong social pressure to manage your front yard in a sort of more homogeneous, presentable way, according to some regional standards versus in the backyard, you're free to do what you want. We found absolutely no evidence for that. We did look at things that we probably should be caring about. Things like, you know, can we increase the amount of carbon storage that occurs in residential landscapes? You know, we know we have to ramp up our use of land as part of a solution to climate change, right? Land can store carbon. Forests are the best place in the terrestrial globe to store uh, carbon. We want to know how much carbon is stored in residential landscapes. What, you know, what are the opportunities for increasing that? And it turns out they're substantial. That, that, so this was our analysis of, of Boston for how much carbon tons per hectare, a hectare is about two and a half acres, uh, in, that are stored in urban, in our, across our gradient, in urban, suburban, and exurban uh, in, in environments. And this was uh, uh, the, the, the uh, comparison of how much carbon was stored in natural areas in and around Boston. So for, for each city, we not only looked at yards and residential landscapes, we looked at the natural landscape from which those were originally de de derived in Boston, that was Eastern deciduous forest in big preserves like the Blue Hills or a couple of big mass Audubon sanctuaries. Uh, and then we had some measurements at the Harvard Forest and then we had some measurements across Cape Cod in the sort of the bigger forests on Cape Cod that was actually done by the Harvard Forest, but on Cape Cod. And you can see that while there's lower carbon in urban and suburban environments. You know, it is greater in exurban environments where greater portions of people's yards are sort of unmanaged, somewhat forested uh, uh, pieces of yards. Uh, but that you know, there's there's room for actually growing more carbon in suburban uh, environments. And uh, you know, we think this is important, but there are also some things that might be limiting how much carbon you might ultimately get to. And I, one of those things I think is sort of global change that brings more wet storms. You didn't maybe have the accumulated branch breaking snow yesterday in Nantucket that we had in Falmouth, but there's always this balance between, you know, I let my trees grow big in my yard or, you know, and do I put up the risk that these trees might, might fall down? And so, uh, always in these residential landscapes, there's there's this balance between what we can, you know, potentially might be there and what might be practical in terms of management. The other thing we did was we looked at sort of these, you know, compare these urban, you know, forests, residential forests versus the native forest using those those native areas that I, I mentioned in the last slide, and it turns out it's very interesting that. Residential landscapes here, these, so the green are the natural areas, you know, there's this distribution, a lot of small trees, not so many big trees, but it turns out in these residential landscapes, you've got a lot of big trees and big trees store disproportionate amounts of carbon, of course, because the carbon is a function of the volume and the volume increases as the cube of the diameter of the tree. So uh, resident, there's a lot of, you know, a few big trees in residential landscapes can balance out, you know, uh, can make up a, a big percentage of the carbon. It turns out that trees greater than 45 centimeters in diameter, which is, uh, you know, almost two feet, is, is uh, or a foot and a half, I guess I should say, is, is you know, was, was only 13% of the total carbon in the native forest, but 54% in the residential landscape. So saving big trees, managing residential landscapes for really big trees uh, is where you're gonna get the carbon storage in these residential landscapes. The other interesting thing was that in, the, in Boston, a, a, a much higher percentage of that carbon was in non-native tree species like this Norway, like, like Norway maple, for example. 
Uh, so there's this trade-off. Yeah, maybe the trees are getting bigger, but they're non-native species. So Desiree is going to talk about sort of the value of making those species native. I'm here to talk about the fact there's a lot of carbon in those really big trees. The last thing we do, and the, and, and, and the thing I'm going to hand this over to Desiree to talk about, is we, we did a very deep dive into plant diversity in yards. Uh, and in the first phase of this project, we looked at diversity across these urban gradients. Uh, and you know this 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 yard was just uh, it's sort of a fun picture. There's a diversity of lawn ornaments as well as plants, but it has you know these gardens, flower gardens, perennial beds, you know sort of backwoods areas. It has a lawn. It's got all these different components and all these elements add botanical diversity to residential landscape. So while we were pushing things toward a homogeneous middle across a lot of properties. Turns out across plant diversity across all these cities, and this is just the average per you know average of of what we found in each in six cities, right? Uh, compared with natural areas, species richness we found on average, you know, four hundred and about fifty cultivated plant species in yards. Uh, in, 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 in across all the cities. That was the average across all the cities. And it wasn't all that different, surprisingly. We found another 200 plus species of spontaneous plants. These are the plants that aren't necessarily in the native ecosystem, but they come in weeds of all sorts, plants that sort of, you know, come in. Uh, they, they, they can include different kinds of trees that come into yards. Uh, but they're spontaneous. People didn't plant them, whereas these cultivated things are people intentionally put there. And then what's striking here is how low the species richness is in natural ecosystems compared with what is created by people. And so instead of making these landscapes more homogeneous, we are introducing this absolutely spectacular botanical diversity uh, into these residential landscapes. Now what, now what I want to do is, is stop sharing my screen and hand it to Desiree because she's going to talk to you about sort of what this diversity means, how it can be managed, and why some diversity is much more beneficial to uh, a host of wildlife, bees, and birds than others. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen now and get started. All right, can you see it? I'm going to assume that you can. <laughs> um, so hi, everybody. I'm Desiree Narango. Um, I've had the privilege to work on this project for the last uh, two and a half years. And um, Chris has talked to you about residential yards as a homogenizing force. Now I'm going to talk to you about um, what it might mean if somebody decides to do something different. So you know, if we think about urban areas uh, and we're looking at where is the green space in an urban or suburban area, most of it is locked up in residential yards. And so uh, these are real kind of conservation and restoration opportunities, except that when we look at, you know, the landscaping styles that people are adopting in their yards, a lot of times they can be this really like kind of tidy, neat lawn of turf grass and a few plants here or there. Um, think the traditional American suburban lawn. Um, and you might think, well, hey, that's, that's probably not going to have a lot of potential to support biodiversity. Um, but now we're having um, kind of some people are starting to adopt some new landscaping styles or some um, alternative um, uh, nature-based landscaping. So think uh, adding in a pollinator garden, adding in wildlife friendly, friendly habitat features, or adding in um, elements to your landscaping that promote plant, soil, or water conservation. Um, and right now, you know, this kind of nature-based yard landscaping approach is considered to be uh, part of a conservation solution, but we actually have surprisingly little information uh, to test whether these landscaping styles are actually restoring biodiversity and land in the way that we think that they are. Um, and of course, if we think about a yard, it's not just a single uh, entity that's operating independently, it's embedded within a larger context. Um, so your yard is near different park areas that could potentially also be supporting biodiversity. 
Uh, we, um, your yard has your neighbors, your neighbors are doing certain things that might be contributing to uh, the ecological integrity of your yard, as well as um, different choices that your town or municipality might be making. So whether they have tree canopies, um, uh, or whether they're uh, spraying systematic uh, pesticides or something, you know. Uh, so we want to also consider if we're comparing these different yard management styles, um, you know, do they compare in the same amount of biodiversity and, and also while taking into account uh, both regional and neighborhood scale uh, variation as well. And so to kind of test these, these different yard management styles. Again, this is embedded within this macro systems project. So this is our map of our cities. Again, they all vary in uh, regional uh, species, in their climates, um, in, in their local city context. And we wanted to um, collect the same kind of data in each one of these cities in different uh, yard management styles and compare how well that they're supporting plant and animal biodiversity. And so um, this is uh, a few of the styles that we were um, interested in. So we, we also collected data in parks as well. So parks that were considered our reference natural areas, as well as uh, urban parks that were embedded within the city. Um, and these are considered what we would call land sparing type approaches. So we're setting aside land specifically for biodiversity. And then we had uh, two different yard management styles that were geared towards uh, prioritizing lawn. So high input lawn, which would be, you know, adding tons of fertilizer and irrigation and really putting a lot of effort into your lawn. And then low input lawn, which is kind of like a laissez faire, eh, I'll just see what happens, but I still want to have a lot of lawn. Um, and then we had two what we call conservation oriented approaches or these nature based approaches. And these are, were uh, wildlife certified yards through the National Wildlife Federation. So these are yards that have, uh, that have wildlife friendly features such as uh, food, shelter, or water for wildlife. And then we also had yards that were landscape for water conservation. So these are rain gardens in our temperate cities like Boston, um, and then drought tolerant landscaping in our arid cities like LA. And um, for, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to share with you some of the results that compare these different uh, yard management styles. And the conservation yards are always going to be in purple. So if you want to see where they end up, just look for the purple. Um, so first, I'll share with you a little bit of the results from our plants. And it's just really impressive just how much plant data was, was collected in these yards by going out and just getting on our hands and knees and just counting just how many different plants were out there. Uh, like Chris showed you before, just tremendous diversity is in these yards. But when we look at the different styles, we see that our nature-based yards, so these are water conservation and wildlife friendly yards, have above and beyond plant diversity. So they have tremendous more taxonomic diversity, um, many more species compared to our two different lawn types and also more than what we found in our parks, both within and outside of the city. Uh, we've also looked at percent tree canopy cover and by comparing the yards for percent tree canopy cover, we don't see a lot of differences. Most of our differences are happening uh, between cities. So in Phoenix and LA, very little tree canopy cover as you would expect in a desert ecosystem. And then lots more tree canopy cover in our temperate cities, uh, but not a lot of difference between those yard types. Uh, we're starting to look at the number of native plants that are in these different yard types. And um, just to give you a sense, there's a lot of variation even among different styles. So here is uh, wildlife friendly yards. Um, and in Boston, they can vary from 40 to 50% of the native species uh, of the of the species are uh, native to the Boston ecosystem, um, which can turn out to be 70 to 130 of the species in the yard that are native. Uh, but in our arid systems, we see something very different. So in LA and Phoenix, only one to 7% of the plant species are considered native to the ecosystem, even within these wildlife friendly yards. 
Um, so for our wildlife friendly yards and especially for our lawns, native plants are not making up very much of the plant diversity at all. And so um, for the biodiversity that we looked at, one of um, the animals that we were interested in were birds. Uh, everybody is interested in attracting birds to their lawn. They're wonderful. Um, they wonderful animals that provide great ecosystem services. They eat uh, pests that are on our plants. They, they disperse seeds. Uh, they're also beautiful and lovely to listen to. And so what we did is go out to each one of these yards and we conducted these um, systematic surveys so that we could identify all the species that we saw and heard uh, within that yard. And when we compare the different types, we see that I'm just going to show here for the wildlife certified yards, um, we see that they tend to have really high diversity um, relative to our local parks. They actually have more bird diversity. Um, they have really high migratory species as well. So these are uh, birds that um, migrate to the rainforest and then come back to Boston to breed. Um, the yards are doing okay, just as well as the parks at supporting our migratory bird species. Um, but our, where we really saw differences between the yard types is that our yard, our wildlife yards were very different when we compared each other in their bird communities. So you could go to one yard and get one bird community and you can go to another yard and get a completely different bird community. And so when we think about how that might scale to a larger city, our wildlife friendly yards have more potential to support higher bird diversity than our lawn types. Um, and the other thing to say is that, you know, these, these wildlife certified yards also support a lot of species that people like and have high public appeal. And so it really speaks to this social value uh, that these yards are supporting in terms of bird biodiversity, in addition to supporting um, a conservation value as well. Uh, the next um, animal that I'd like to talk about here is ground beetles, which is uh, an insect that not a lot of people think about. But if you are interested in having, um, you know, great vegetables in your yard or beautiful blooming plants, these are your friends because these are the insects that are taking care of those other insects that might uh, reduce the health of your plant. So they're a really great uh, predator of other insects and just provide wonderful ecosystem services. And so we were interested in how these different yard types varied in the ground beetle diversity and abundance that they supported. And what we found here is not a lot of difference between the yards. We, all, we tended to find uh, per trap more beetles that were found in our parks uh, than we were finding in our yards. We didn't see a lot of difference between these lawns, which are here in green, and our conserva our nature-based yards, which are here in purple. Um, but we didn't see a difference because we weren't accounting for neighborhood scale effects. And so when we actually take into account the tree canopy within a local area, so here on the Y is a uh, percent tree canopy, think uh, around you um, coming from your neighbor's house. And as the tree canopy increases, we see much higher benefits in our wildlife, uh, in our wildlife uh, certified yards and our water conservation yards um, than we do in our lawns or in our parks. Um, so we get a lot more bang for our buck by landscaping with a wildlife um, conservation mindset um, than if we're landscaping for lawns. And often when, we, when we're interested in why this might be, we can look at the identity of the species that we're capturing in these yards to give us some sense of, of, of what those mechanisms might be. Um, so in general, in our nature-based yards, they even though they had high, they had higher by um, higher diversity as tree canopy increases, they were supporting fewer habitat specialists, um, fewer of our um, nocturnal species and our large species, which tend to be more sensitive, and more non-native species, unless there was high tree canopy. So now, when your neighbors are buying in and increasing your tree canopy, and you're increasing your tree canopy at, in your parcel, now we're getting more native species, more larger species, and more habitat specialists in our nature-based yards. Um, so we need that restoration in the central parcel, but we also need some help from our neighbors as well. 
Now I want to share with you a little bit of our results from the bee perspective. Um, many of us are really interested in conserving uh, bee diversity because of their tremendous pollination services that they provide. And so to sample the bees in our different yards, we put out these plastic bee bowls, um, which are colored in different colors that actually attract the bees into them. And then we can take them into the lab and identify them so we can see what species that we're actually getting. And so uh, what we found is this is uh, results from Baltimore, Maryland, which is a, a temperate city. And so um, this is kind of a, a species accumulation curve. So as we increase the number of individual bees that we identify, we get much more species diversity in our different yard types, in our wildlife yards, our water yards, and our lawns compared to our parks. And um, this is consistent with the, um, with, with the bee literature in that urban areas and yards in particular tend to be really great for bees because we, uh, we landscape with things that bees really like, which is flowers. <laughs> um, and so at least for Baltimore and Boston, we were seeing that these yards, no matter how they were landscaped, tended to be great for bees. Um, but are those patterns consistent across cities. That's one of these um, main things that we're interested in. And so if we fly across the country to Los Angeles or to Phoenix, Arizona, we see a complete opposite relationship. So now we see tremendous abundance and diversity in our parks and in our, our fragmented urban parks um, and a little bit less, but still high diversity in our wildlife friendly yards. And we see very, very little uh, bee diversity in our water conservation and our lawn dominated yard types. Um, and this is really important because in our desert ecosystems of um, the southwestern US, this, these are the areas of the world that have the most bee diversity of any other ecosystem in the world. And so here where we have this tremendous diversity of really sensitive species um, that, that we really need to conserve as much as we can, we see that the only yard that's doing anything to, to conserve them are these wildlife friendly yards. And so why might that be? Again, we can look at the identities of the species to try to give us some sense um, for what the, those features might be in the yard that, that are promoting bee diversity. Um, and what we see is that compared to the lawns, we see that our wildlife friendly yards have increases in uh, pollen specialists. So these are bees that only, only eat one kind of pollen from particular kinds of plants. Um, they won't just go to any flower that's out there. They need specific pollen in order to feed their young. And so we get more of these pollen specialists in our wildlife friendly yards. We get increases in our stem nesters. Um, so uh, here's a bee right here. They make their brood inside of these dead stems, which is another way, another good reason for you to leave behind all of those dead flowers at the end of the season. Um, we got increases in the number of species that nest in the ground. Um, like our adrenid bee here. And we had decreases in habitat generalist species. So these are things like honeybees and, and bees that will just use any resource that's out there. So we got more of our specialized species uh, that require specific habitats or specific diets. Um, and so in the case of promoting bee diversity, our wildlife friendly yards um, potentially have more native plant diversity than our lawn types. Um, they might have more nesting locations and more just heterogeneity in their yard. So heterogeneity be meaning um, more different kinds of habitat features in the yard. And what that ends up equaling is more specialist bees. <clears throat> um, when I, when I give talks about, about bees, a lot of times folks are really surprised to learn um, that, that bees can be specialized at all. So I like to add in um, this slide here that kind of shows you some of the plants that you could plant in, uh, um, in the New England area uh, that prioritize these pollen specialists. Um, and so, um, and, and again, we got more, of these uh, pollen specialists in, in our Boston area yards, wildlife friendly yards as well. And so it's likely that these are the yards that are supporting some of these 
plants that provide resources for more species of pollen specialists. So um, in the eastern United States, more than 30% of our bees are considered pollen specialists. Um, and it turns out that uh, in bees, a lot of times there's one bee to one plant, but we can look and see which one of those plants tend to support more species. So for the eastern US, we have willows at 14 species, goldenrod at 34, um, black-eyed Susan support 26 pollen species, uh, blueberries um, 10. So if you wanna prioritize these pollen specialist bees, you should start including some of these uh, plants in, in, your, in your pollinator gardens and in your landscaping. And it turns out that the bees uh, that are in the most serious decline are the ones that are the most specialized for particular diets. And when you plant the plants that these bees need, um, you're gonna get those generalist species as well. So you're gonna get bumblebees, you're gonna get honeybees, um, you're just gonna have more bang for your buck in supporting uh, local bee diversity. Um, so in terms of comparing our different yard types, what we found is that in general, our wildlife certified yards were doing pretty good. Um, they tended to have more plant diversity. Um, they may have more native plant diversity. That's something that we're working on. Um, they tend to have really high heterogeneity in birds. So they tend to have different bird communities compared to our lawns that have very similar bird communities. Um, they have more beetle diversity, especially when they uh, when tree canopies are increased. And they tend to have more bee diversity even across um, different uh, ecosystems. They tend to have more bee diversity compared to our different yard types. And so, if you're asking yourself, what can I do to make my yard better? Um, there's, there's a lot that you can do. So um, one of the first things that I wanna emphasize is be lazy <laughs> because one of the things that you can do to, um, to promote uh, wildlife conservation in your yard is to just step back and let your yard go a little bit wild. Let there be more heterogeneity and features. Um, you can do low mow, uh, you can reduce the amount of lawn, uh, reduce the amount of pesticides that you throw out because that's gonna reduce the insect diversity. Um, increase the native plant diversity um, and increase the heterogeneity that's in your yard. And especially for these nature-based yards, they can look really pretty while also promoting these wildlife friendly habitat features, which do have uh, a benefit to local biodiversity. And so um, just to end a little bit with some other evidence of, that supports some of these different things that you can do. So another study uh, from a colleague of mine um, looked at how much you mow your lawn, how does that affect bee diversity? And what she found was that if you reduce the amount of lawn mowing um, from mowing every week to mowing every two weeks, your lawn will produce the flowers that are necessary to support bees in your local area. So you'll get more bee diversity and more bee abundance if you reduce your lawn just to mowing every other week instead of um, once a week. So being a lazy lawn mower is a great way to support biodiversity. The other thing that you can do is plant native plants. And I've said this a couple of times um, about the importance of native plants for biodiversity. And a lot of this is based on some of my previous work, uh, looking at how both native and non-native plants are supporting insect and bird communities. Um, and so what we found is that our native plants tend to support a lot higher biomass of caterpillars and other insects and arthropods. Um, and these caterpillars that eat these plants are what are turning into your beautiful butterflies um, and beautiful moths um, that provide those amazing pollinator services and um, bring so much wonderful color to your yard. But you have to, in addition to providing flowers to attract the butterflies, you also need to plant the native plants that these uh, caterpillars need to survive. Um, and in addition to just supporting these butterflies and their caterpillars, um, it's also really beneficial to um, local bird diversity as well. And so what we also found is that um, when we have more native plant diversity, um, 
we have more chickadees and other insect eating birds. And so here, this is non-native plant biomass um, here on the Y, number of chickadees per territory here on the X. And as non-native plants that don't support insects increase, we get many fewer of these baby birds that are surviving to leave their nests. So if you wanna have uh, insect eating birds in your yards, like these wonderful chickadees, you need to prioritize these native plants. Um, <clears throat> another thing that you can do is to leave the leaves. And so, and I like to uh, kind of emphasize this because when we think about providing habitat for birds or bees or butterflies or moths, a lot of times we don't think about uh, in the winter time, where are birds finding food? A lot of times they're finding it in leaf litter. Um, where do our moths go and our bees go in the winter time? They're hiding and hibernating underneath that leaf litter. And when we take that away so that we can have these bare lawns, that's taking away this really important winter habitat that these animals need to survive. So that's a very important contribution to pollinator habitat. And so the last thing I wanna to touch on here is that um, in addition to doing things in your yard, which can have tremendous benefits to biodiversity, it's great to get involved at larger scales. Um, and so if we wanna support biodiversity in our urban and suburban areas, we need to ask places like Home Depot to support the plants that we need uh, to provide for this wildlife. We need to think about where we can find conservation opportunities in novel places like our yards and our roadsides. Um, and in order to do that, it's really great if people like you that are, that are excited about supporting these plants and animals get involved in your local community groups and your HOAs to try to make uh, change happen. And that's where we can really make uh, some really benefits to biodiversity at larger scales. And so uh, I'll just end by saying I provided you with some um, evidence that if you uh, landscape your yards for wildlife, it does have a benefit and provided um, some of the different features that you can prioritize um, that will support our plants and animals. And, um, and I hope that you take home that, you know, your yard matters. Like it's not just a barren landscape. It really supports a lot of wildlife and services. Um, and if we arm ourselves with the information that we need to make change, we can really make landscapes that are both beautiful and functional. Um, if you want more information about um, this project that Chris and I talked about, as well as um, uh, other, other um, important information about landscaping your yard, I encourage you to go to the Native Plant Trust where you um, can find more information about our, our work um, and we'll be posting blogs about some of our progress um, with this research. And so with that, thank you so much for your time. Um, you can also visit our website if you wanna download any of our papers and please feel free to email me if you have any questions about anything that I presented today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Desiree and Chris. I know this is, I always say this, but with Zoom now I'm always like, we don't have the clapping feature anymore. <laughs> <laughs> is the bummer of it. Um, so uh, we have time for questions. So um, I know a few have come in, but I just want to encourage anyone else who has uh, questions for Desiree or Chris um, about the project in general or things we can do in our yard, please feel free to either type in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, I have some questions I wrote down myself, uh, both as a scientist and as a yard manager <laughs> of my own yard. So um, let's dive in. Um, so uh, Neil asked, um, oh, this is um, when we were talking about the trees and tree canopy um, data. So he asked, uh, for trees with a high DBH, is the age to maturity a factor in calculating carbon storage, carbon storage benefit? Specifically thinking about the big maples, like silver maple, red maple in Norway that grow big really quickly, but then might die. Um, so just thinking about canopy and fast-growing species. Yeah, the, the, I, can, I can answer that. The, the, the carbon storage is a function of the, 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 the biomass of, of the tree, the, sort of the mass of the, of the, in the wood. And so, of course, if a tree dies, then the, the, the carbon stored in that tree becomes a function of what happens to the tree after it's 
died. If it gets made into houses and furniture, then at least a portion of that sort of remains out of the atmosphere for a longer time. If it just goes and, and, and rots uh, on the ground or, uh, then, or, or gets burned in a wood stove, then uh, it, that goes right back into the atmosphere right away. So the, the, it, it's a question of, you know, the trees that will store the most carbon are, they grow fast, they have dense wood and they live a long time. And, and you know, red oak is a perfect example in our Boston sort of suburban landscape of a hard wooded, long lived, fairly fast growing tree that sort of serves that function. The, you know, this, the Norway maple, you know, grows big, grows fast, you know, might live many, many decades, a hundred plus years. And so, you know, that does actually help, you know, we got to get carbon out of the atmosphere in the next, you know, year and decade, not, you know, so, so, so if it dies in a hundred years, hopefully we've, 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 that buys us a little bit of time. So, so trees that grow big and live a hundred years are, are good. Trees, you know, so, so, so big, big trees are the ones you want. Um, so there was an, a question about clover lawn. So um, Leah asked, she said, I would love to have a clover yard. Do you recommend that? And also do you have particular species that would be good to use for clover lawns? I also have this question. Oh, um, I can take that. So, um, so clover is uh, very attractive to bees. Um, it also supports a lot of um, butterflies and moths. And so clover in general is pretty good, but most of the clover that you can get easily is uh, white clover or red clover. I think a lot of that is planted for deer and things. And both of those are non-native. Um, so if you're interested in a native clover, it's probably going to be a little bit more difficult to get that. And, but there are, there are folks that are, um, that are out there like landscapers that will, um, uh, that have different kind of alternative seed mixes for lawns that can be native or mixes of native and non-native that will help you get to that goal so that you can reduce the turf grass and up the uh, clover. And so it just depends on how much effort you want to put in that because I think for, um, you know, the native, and I haven't done this by myself, but for the native clover species, it would be more difficult and maybe require um, more specific uh, um, conditions like shade. Um, and, but a landscaper can definitely help you um, reach those goals. And um, I'll just make a side note for those on Nantucket um, that we have a hard time with native, um, native seeds, like with our local genotypes. Um, mm -hmm. And so Chris and I have been talking with our sampling grassland network. Um, there's a lot of great seed mixes on Long Island that are actually maybe more similar to our habitat types here on Nantucket than other parts of Massachusetts. So just a note for people um, that are looking for their um, native seeds, you know, native is, depends on where you are, what native is and how broad, far afield you look too. So, um, okay, so we have a bunch of questions. So Sean Allen asks, as someone interested in food forests, I suppose I'm wondering how to construct an ecosystem in my yard that benefits myself and my agrarian needs while also sustaining local wildlife. Yeah, lots of lots of native, you know, food producing trees. Well, I don't know how many of them are native. Blue, blueberries, go blueberries. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there's a there's a lot of woody um, plants that can support um, food for you as well as food for wildlife. So blueberries are one that's great. So it's great for bees. It's great for butterflies. It's great for birds. Uh, you know, that that's an excellent route to go. Um, we can also think about um, some of the different uh, trees supply nuts that you can use. Um, but, you know, you can also partition. I mean, your yard has to support you too, right? And so you can think about how can I have a vegetable garden that has this part of my yard and then maybe think about how I can add natural land or natural habitat in other parts of my yard. And they can work in synergy because the birds that you attract using the natural landscaping will then provide pest control on the insects that are on your vegetable plants. So the insects that are gonna be on trees are not the same ones that are on your broccoli and your kale. Those are insects that are specialized for those particular vegetables. You're going to get them whether you have natural landscaping or not. But if you bring in the birds and the ground beetles and other ones of those predators, they can really work in synergy with your vegetable gardens and your food gardens that you're working towards. Um, hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> 
That's great. I'm going to interject with my own question because I'm running the show so I can do that. But um, <laughs> so I have a question for, um, you know, actually some of the methodology. So did people in that were participating in the study or the yards that you included, did homeowners collect the data? Did you have teams of people go out obviously to all these different cities? I'm just curious how some of that methodology worked. I can answer that. No, homeowners didn't collect anything. It was all teams of people that we organized. Uh, and so, you know, we were to some extent limited in how many yards we could visit because, you know, to do a full biodiversity, you know, plant inventory on a yard took a day with trained botany, you know, trained botanists and trained crew. So we could do, you know, 30, 35 uh, in, in a summer uh, in, in a city, uh, lots of travel time, lots of time spent in traffic. It wasn't, you know, sounds romantic, but it wasn't really that romantic in terms of how it worked. Uh, and we would make a bunch of measurements, often have to make a couple of visits. And we solicited homeowners. We, 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 we did this survey, picked people at random within certain density and economic uh, strata uh, by census uh, and sort of advertising uh, methodologies. Uh, and then we, we, we phoned them and then out of the people who fell into the right land categories, we just kind of went down the list and randomly and got people to agree uh, to participate. Uh, so uh, yeah, the challenge for these things, and, and it is, could, could become a, a bigger citizen science project is for people to be, do their own inventories on their yards, add to the uh, add to the, the, uh, the database, uh, maybe not in terms of everything because everybody can't identify bees, but those who could identify plants or bird surveys or things like that. And, and Des is working on some things, you know, trying to think about ways you could use eBird and, or, you, you know, yeah. urban environments to, to begin to get out, you know, things have changed dramatically in the last, you know, few years about the data that people can generate their, on their own. Um, but we just chose a s sort of systematic, uh, you know, exactly the same methodology across all the cities. Great, thanks. Um, so we have um, Anne asked for the newbie to this conversation, can you please define a cultivar versus a native plant? Oh, sure. Um, so uh, a cultivar is a plant that has been bred specifically for certain traits. And so, um, you know, a, a cultivar in horticulture often has like a name associated with that genetic line. Um, so I think, you know, one example, I think it's called like blue muffin viburnum dentatum, which is um, a native viburnum that's been bred to have really beautiful blue fruits. Um, and so, uh, for the purposes of, um, you know, and a cultivar can be native or non-native, um, but, um, and a native plant is specifically re referring to where the origin of that plant is. Like, did it evolve naturally in this ecosystem, um, either Eastern United States or, or Massachusetts or your ecosystem in Massachusetts, depending on what scale that you're most interested in. Um, and what, and yeah, so. Yeah, they're bred varieties of, of, of plants. They can be native or non-native, but a lot of these, a lot of nurseries have native cultivars of, yeah, the viburnums of the, 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 is a good example. Yeah, and I think um, going to your local nature, or not nature center, sorry, your, you know, your local plant centers, oftentimes the people that work there have the best knowledge of, you know, what's, um, what they're selling there that are the native um, cultivars too, that would work well in, in that. That the the secret, I mean, Desiree's done all this marvelous work on this sort of food web relationships, you know, that the native plants support the caterpillars that have, and the key is that they've evolved with these native plants, right? They can tolerate the chemicals that these plants produce to try to keep herbivores away because they've evolved with them. And you put these same native caterpillars on non-native plants and they can't eat them because they haven't sort of, you know, evolved with the chemistry that those have. So the native cultivars have, since it hasn't, they haven't been selected for the chemistry of the leaves, they still have the native chemistry for, 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 for in some respects, right? There's a lot of stuff we yeah. probably don't know about that. We, we've actually done a study on that. And for the plants 
where color in the leaf is selected for, that mm. does change leaf chemistry and that does yeah. affect insects. But for everything else, like a dwarf plant or a weird leaf shape or more fruit, like none of that actually, you know, impacts the, the native insects, um, at least in our study. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so sort of a follow up um, was about should, uh, you know, researching online beforehand versus trusting the labels on the plants in the garden centers. <laughs> so don't don't ever trust the common names. <laughs> Always look for the scientific names. Keep your phone on hand. Google that, <laughs> and then you know, and and that's you know, and it also kind of supports um, a reason to support local small businesses and small nurseries is that they will know more about the plants. So when I, when I when I get talks about native and non-native plants, you always got to think about, you know, what, what input are, are you able to do? Like, are you able to get locally genetic native, you know, uh, um, genetic lines of native plants? Or are you looking for something that's native to the Eastern ecosystem? Um, and a small business, those nursery owners, they will help you um, with that. And, uh, and the scientific name will help you figure out exactly what that plant is. And I, I also think like asking your local nature center too, because if they hear demand for certain things, then they're going to like the customer drives some of those orders too at the smaller scale. Um, so similarly um, about the sourcing, uh, Rain asked, has Home Depot stopped using their neonicotinoids that, or neonics, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> Otherwise it could be counterproductive if people think they're buying like native for diversity, but then they're systematically killing insects that visit it. For sure. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so some of the plants that are in Home Depot do have a label that says that they don't have systemic pesticides. So if it doesn't have that label, I would not trust it. Um, but the reason I put up that picture of a Home Depot is because I want you to go there and tell them that that's wrong and that they shouldn't <laughs> have those plants. And um, and again, support your local businesses that don't have those uh you know, plants with systemic pesticides. Cause you're right, we don't want to plant, this is, that's even worse to plant a plant that attracts a butterfly in to lay her eggs and then none of the eggs survive. Like we don't want that to happen. So, so make sure that, um, you know, that, that the plants that you're buying which often from small local nurseries, native plant sales, your local nature centers those are not going to have those pesticides. Yeah, um, so I had a question for you. I know, um, you know, this work has been in progress for some time too, and at least the data collection part. And we talked a lot about the nature-based yards and like, you know, the Eastern versus sort of some of the Western areas that were more arid. Do you have suggestions or has anything come up in your research for areas like Nantucket where we're talking, we're starting to think a lot about coastal resiliency and how we can plan our yards to manage water, both obviously people on the more coastal areas, um, but also the drainage and, you know, kind of filtration of water and holding water. I mean, obviously there's certain species that do better for that, but then how does that help? You know, just thinking about with the research, um, have, has that, any of that come up at all? I'm gonna let Chris take coastal. In terms of the water question? <laughs> yeah, just in terms of, you know, we're thinking a lot as an island about, um, recommending plantings or yard maintenance that will help um, with water um, retention yeah. or yeah. water filtration the, the, as we the, get more inundation with the, both storms and storm yeah. surge and obviously there's a salt tolerance issue but I just was wondering if any of this has yeah happened. yeah I mean we're you know we Nantucket is a great example right and Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard are the same we have these landscapes that are marvelous at infiltrating water so we you know it Reducing pavement has a little bit less effect here because water just runs off pavement and right into the ground, you know, in, in, unless you exceed some large density of pavement that we generally don't have on even on Cape Cod still, uh, let alone Nantucket. So, so, so the, the, but the, but the, but the water quality is an enormous issue, right? There's a huge nitrogen problem. Too much nitrogen is running off of land onto the, you know, in, into the estuaries where it causes algae blooms and anoxia, fish gills, and other things. And we've lost eelgrass and scallops and all these things that go along with it. So, to me, the key is just reducing nitrogen input from that residential landscape. Just getting rid of, fer you know, not fertilizing lawn at all. Uh, to me is the answer. Uh, I, I'm not, I mean, using organic nitrogen fertilizer helps a little bit because it slows the release and more of it is time to go into the plant. 
uh, when the plant is growing because the release is slower, but it's not, it's not that, it doesn't make that much of a difference. Um, a a, a non-fertilized landscape, whether it's grass, trees, shrubs, will, will, will act quite a bit like a native ecosystem and keep any nitrogen coming from the atmosphere out of the water. But you undo that completely when you put fertilizer. So, so I think the biggest, highest impact thing you could do is not use any fertilizer at all. And just put up with what Desiree was saying, the sort of raggedy, more diverse, you know, sort of scruffy looking, you know, sort of, sort of, you know, ecosystem that comes with, with not putting fertilizer. And the downside fertilizer often comes with weed killers. I can go and walk in my neighborhood and I can tell you who's putting fertilizer just by who doesn't have broadleaf weeds in their lawn because it all comes in one package from the hardware store. I have to say that I love that I um, already have a very um, nature friendly yard just by your description of scraggly and random stuff popping up everywhere. But I sort of already knew that. But that, um, I know we only have time for a few more questions, but um, what you were just saying kind of folds into Rebecca's question, which is I have thoughts about convincing neighbors and communities of the merits of moving away from this cultivated monoculture to more environmentally friendly yards. And I live in a neighborhood like that. I'm on the HOA, but there is that as exactly as you're saying, Chris, the very, very green lawn, mine, the very, very green lawn, you know, so how do we kind of work through some of that? That's a good question. <laughs> you want me to, I, I'll, 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 you know. I have so, an so answer, it, but you could go first. It, no, it depends, yeah, it, it depends on where you are. Uh, you know, so, so I just, you know, tell you, tell you a story and my neighborhood in, in Falmouth was sort of single family, you know, neighborhood. It, uh, isn't super, uh, fancy, but it's not, uh, downtrodden at, at all. Uh, and you know, I, I have to say when I took some seeds from an, a restoration experiment in grasslands, I, I was doing with the nature conservancy folks on Martha's Vineyard. And I, you know, sort of made my, my front lawn, a, a meadow with uh, sort of sand plain golden rods and asters and little blue stem and stuff like that, you know, I got a lot of comments, not all that positive from my neighbor, like when you're gonna mow, you know, this look <laughs> doesn't look so great. And time was a great equalizer. And, 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 and I just sort of tried to use that as an, an opportunity to educate my neighbors and the comments sort of started decreasing over time and we don't have a, homeowners association that has any isn't isn't really active or has has teeth but you know there's just this propensity to mow the little common spaces and do all this you know i just keep you know so so it, it can be an uphill battle but i think creating some examples and having those be the sort of the the influential people in the neighborhood you know it, it, and they can be the ambassadors for this and i think that's it's, it's really got a it, it's taking off it's i mean compared with five ten years ago this is a much grander concept more people doing it but it's got to be sort of almost a one-on-one -on -one in my in my opinion you're not going to mandate this from a homeowner association so i have a four-tiered answer but i'll try not to, <laughs> i'll try to be brief so first of all, it's great that you're involved. A lot of times these conservation commissions and whatnot are looking for people to come in and take effort. Like I'm putting in a native plant garden because I'm the one that stepped up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the second thing is, in, you know, instead of being weedy, making it intentionally weedy can make a big difference. So, you know, having a pollinator garden with, but putting up a nice little fence in front of it can be the difference between something that is intentional and something that looks like you just let it go. The third thing that I want to say is that um, uh, tug at people's heartstrings. So a lot of people like birds, not a lot of people like insects. So use birds to your advantage if you want to, you know, say you want to plant more trees or plant more native plants. Um, that, use the cardinal, right? Everybody loves cardinals. Like, <laughs> And then the last thing that I want to say is that it's also okay to compromise in the steps to restoration. So in this paper that I didn't talk about, feel free to email me if you want more information. We talk about how 30% non-native plants is a threshold. And once you get more than that, then, um, then that's detrimental to birds, right? So that gives you a little bit of wiggle room. And I've seen a mm -hmm. lot of people buy into that wiggle room and say, oh, I can have my Japanese maple that's not invasive. Okay, now let's plant oak trees. And so if we can compromise a little bit more, mm -hmm. we can start making incremental change. Mm 
I really appreciate that, Desiree, because we give a lot of, you know, talks and we do a lot of things with the public on Nantucket and there's certain species that people just love and identify yeah, with the island and it's like it's okay you yeah. know it's it's more about increasing that native diversity and so I really appreciate that um we are gonna have to wrap up there's a few more questions but I see Chris is typing answers too oh, thanks Chris um one is about using lime on lawns I think uh Chris answered that um and then I, 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 this is my other crusade is like, yeah, natives, but also so lime has long lasting effects and higher pH tends to favor the sort of cool season grasses that 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 we that we don't necessarily want in our coastal grasslands. And and and, and so I, I think it's uh, it, it, the effects of lime will fade over time, but they're long lasting. And, and we've gone back on Martha's Vineyard and looked at places that were limed in the in the early 1900s and 1920s and 30s, and we still see a, a more non-native plants compared with native plants on those sites that were agriculture in the 1920s and had a lot of lime and still have higher pH. So if you have a, yeah, if you're adding lime for the first time, I think it's a bigger detriment than if you just continue putting it uh, but, but but I would I would also like fertilizer sort of stay. It depends from. where you like maybe where your spot is in yeah. look relation to other open space yeah. conservation areas. Lime doesn't have the water quality water quality consequences, uh, mm -hmm. nitrogen or you know, fertilizer does. So in that sense it's not nearly as bad. It's more of a, a, a legacy effect on the plants. Um and then I think this kind of feeds into the last question, Sean's question about um the, he says, my place and maintenance of invasive or alien species. So dandelions, for example, are able to support bee populations, but I'm wondering about stabilizing ecosystem versus completely purging non-native species. So I think that's where that wiggle room comes in, Desiree, that you were just you were just referencing. Um, yeah. And does the size of it matter too? You know, like a few dandelions in your lawn versus, you know, like a larger non-native shrub that's affecting more. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if we think about the biomass of dandelions, like having some dandelions in your lawn that's also allowing your kids to play soccer is a dual benefit. Having a gigantic burning bush that's sourcing berries into the forest and crowding out native plant communities because it's invasive is a much bigger detriment to um, the ecology of your local ecosystem. So, um, you know, there's you know, I am not of the camp that every non-native is like evil. It's thinking about how we can be, you know, how can we prioritize plants that are functional um, and also work for us. Um, and also, you know, and so starting with getting rid of the invasives is a great first step because you're gonna in turn improve your yard, but also improve the plant communities that are around because it's going to let those native plant communities get a leg up over the competition. So, um, so that's, that's kind of lowest hanging fruit. Get rid of your invasives. Don't plant new ones. <laughs> yeah. And plant natives into what you've got without necessarily going on a whole scale eradication effort for all the non-native plants. You've just, you know, you, you, and what you want to do is do those things like not overdo the lime or the fertilizer in ways that favor the sometimes slower growing, uh, uh, less water dependent on Nantucket is important, you know, sort of native species. And just, oh. just to follow up, because I know Sean is one of the people that's on Nantucket, the Nantucket Biodiversity Initiative put out a few years ago a brochure on planting with native species. So it's, um, it's on the Nantucket Biodiversity Initiative website. So if you just Google Nantucket Biodiversity diversity initiative, um, you'll find it, but there's a PDF available and it's based on the habitat or like the, whether you want a shade plant or an open plant or if the wet or dry, there's a like, a, and whether you want a grass or a shrub or a forb, there's um, a thing, uh, um, options for each type. So I would recommend for those on Nantucket, that's a good resource for some natives to start with. Sorry for that plug, but. <laughs> oh, no, it's a great plug. And um, if I could just end with one more thing. The other thing I want to say is that, you know, dandelions are really attractive to bees, but I wanted to put that plug that, you know, which bees actually matters. So it could be that it's attractive to bees, but they would be attracted to any flower that you had in the landscape. And dandelions are just really abundant. And so if you plant some of these really bee-friendly plants, um, you know, you can get both 
Um, so it doesn't mean that you have to have dandelions in your landscape if you if you wanted to take the chance to remove them. Well, Chris and Desiree, thank you so much for being here and for just chatting and staying for a while. I know we went over time, so I hope that didn't um, didn't impact you too much. But I really thank you, and we've had tons of thank yous in the chat for a great presentation and. Um, Thanks again. And so we're going to, I will post the recording um, later this week on the Linda Loring Nature Foundation website, and I will let you guys know. And uh, thank you so much again for being here tonight. You're welcome, Sarah. Thanks for inviting us. <laughs> Bye. All right, thanks Bye. all. Bye, everybody. Bye.